we also need to question the presumption when we remember 1916 that the separatists, the republicans, the rebels were only a tiny unrepresentative group before the rising and before the British reaction to it. They were certainly a minority, but I don't believe they were an isolated group. Many of their ideas were shared by supporters of Home Rule and of John Rittman. There were few nationalists in Ireland in the years before 1916 who would have disagreed with the young John Redman's characterisation of the British Empire as a greedy and bloodthirsty oppressor of the weak. While they expected that their representatives should do their best to get what they could from Westminster, they would also have been aware that in Redman's words, there was no act of justice or reform which has not been extorted in one way or another from the British Parliament by force or fear. Indeed, that no single reform has ever been obtained by purely constitutional methods. While disagreeing with some of the methods of the Fenian bombers of the 1880s, they might have nodded their heads when support was sought for men who are our kith and kin, men who have sacrificed everything that was most dear to them in an effort to benefit Ireland. What do we care whether their effort was a wise one or not, whether a mistaken one or not? And that again is John Redmond in the 1890s campaigning for the release of Fenian prisoners in Britain. Indeed, in 1897, the Welcome Home Rally for one of those prisoners, Tom Clark, was chaired by Redmond's brother William. As late as 1912, Clark himself would acknowledge, despite the very wide political differences between himself and John Redmond, that John Redmond had campaigned very hard and vigorously for his release during those years in prison. So the idea that there's this huge gap between so-called constitutional nationalists and republicans, I think, is a mistake. There's interaction and there's certainly a set of shared assumptions. But of course, John Redmond's views on the British Empire changed. But did anyone else's? It was characteristic of John Redmond's party that they promised self-government home rule would mean a great deal more than it actually would have in reality. William London, the MP for Limerick, for example, would claim that he didn't see a little parliament in Dublin that would pay homage to the big one, but a sovereign and independent parliament. And if he had his own way, he would break the remaining links that bound the two countries. He was trained in another school in 67, and he was not a parliamentarian when he walked with his rifle on his shoulder on the night of the 5th of March. And London, who was MP for Limerick in the early 1900s, is remembering the Fenian Rising, which he'd taken part in as a very young man in 1867. So there are men sitting in the House of Commons for the Home Rule Party who'd been Fenian in their youth. The anthem of the party was a nation once again. And at the end of March 1912, it looked like this vision was finally going to come to pass. Over 100,000 people gathered in Dublin in support of the new Home Rule Bill, which looks set to pass. John Redmond's deputy, John Dillon, told the huge crowds that we have undone and are undoing the work of three centuries of confiscation and persecution. The holy soil of Ireland is passing back rapidly into the possession of the children of our race, and the work of Oliver Cromwell is nearly undone. Now, undoing the work of Oliver Cromwell suggests far more than limited self-government within the British imperial frame. As the radical Lawrence Nugent put it, let it be understood that, outside of the professional politicians, home rule meant to the ordinary citizen freedom for Ireland without any qualifications. The problem was, of course, that home rule would not have brought even the limited independence achieved in 1921. In one crucial aspect, not the only aspect, but crucial, there were usually between 25 to 30,000 British military personnel based in Ireland in those years. A small town like Fermoy and Cork, for example, several hundred people, had a British military presence of 1,700 all the year round. There were eight barracks in Dublin, three British military barracks in Limerick, for example. That would have not have changed under Home Rule. That is one crucial difference between what occurs in 1921-22 and what was promised um, under self-government. And I would again remind people today that the Republic of Ireland has a defence forces of just over 9,000 members at the moment. Under British rule, we had a military presence of up to 30,000 armed men. And again, there are people who argue that 1916 set Ireland on a particularly militaristic path. I think the evidence suggests uh, otherwise. So I would argue that the promise of home rule for many people meant complete freedom, and they were likely to be disappointed if it happened. In the aftermath of the Easter Rising, Augustine Burrell, the Lord Lieutenant, the head of British authority in Ireland, asserted in the, at the Royal Commission for the Rebellion that the spirit of what is today called Sinn Féinism is mainly composed of the old hatred and distrust of the British connection, always noticeable in all classes and all places, varying in degree and finding different ways of expression, but always there as the background of Irish politics and character. Now, I think Burrell was, substan was substantially correct. Most Irish nationalists 
Republicans, from the most moderate Home Ruler to the most radical Republican, simply did not regard British rule as legitimate. As the Land League outfit first circulated in the 1880s put it, E is the English who robbed us of bread, F is the famine they gave us instead. We were talking about a country in 1916 that's only 70 years removed from that catastrophe. And again, the impact of the famine in the longer run cannot be ignored as a factor behind the demand for complete independence. What might those ideas, those assumptions, have meant in the middle of the Eastern Rising? Eamon Roy, in Easter week, was a policeman in Dublin's Great Brunswick Street, which is now Pier Street. Um, he's based in what's now Pier Street Guard Station. And he described police during the Rising, the Dublin Metropolitan Police were confined to barracks. And he recalled during the Rising, several loyal citizens of the old Unionist type called to inquire the British Army and police had not already ejected the Sinn Féiners from the occupied buildings. Whilst the number of that type were present, a big uniformed DMP man, Dublin Metropolitan Policeman, a Clare man, came in. He told us of having gone to his home in Donnybrook to assure himself of the safety of his family. He saw the British Army column, which had landed at Kingstown, Dunleary, marching through Donnybrook. They were singing, he said, but the soldiers that came in by Ball's Bridge didn't do much singing. They ran into a few Irishmen who soon took the singing out of them. We laughed at the long way he said it and the effect on the loyalists present. Now that policeman was talking about Mount Street Bridge and the horrendous casualties suffered by the Sherwood Foresters. But here we have Dublin policemen, in theory agents of the Crown, laughing at British losses and particularly enjoying the discomfort of the Unionists who come in to complain to them. What does that tell us about national strategies? I think it tells us quite a bit really, because the reality of course was, before 1916, for all the talk of the United Kingdom, Ireland was thought of and ruled like a colony. It was not Canada, New Zealand or Australia or even South Africa. It was not a settler state where the majority of citizens identified with the mother country. That is the reason why it was India that was continually referenced by Conservatives in debates about self-government at Westminster. That is why Home Rule MPs could be dismissed by Tories and the Commons as 80 foreigners. In 1874, Benjamin Disraeli, no less, had claimed that Ireland was governed by laws of coercion and stringent severity that do not exist in any other quarter of the globe. Over 100 such coercion acts were passed during the 1800s. The suspension of civil liberties and the subject's right to protection from arbitrary state power in Ireland was almost permanent. At the executive level, Ireland retained, unlike Scotland or Wales, a civil service and policy administration that was wholly separate from England's. As a result, the actual head of the Irish bureaucracy was a minister of the Crown. Like India, the British administration was headed by a viceroy, the Lord Lieutenant, and he and the Chief Secretary and Under Secretary were appointed to run Ireland. And it's most benign such official that was characterised in the words of one contemporary observer by a gentle, quiet, well-meaning, established, unconscious, inborn content. The problem was, of course, that by the early 1900s, Irish society had changed drastically since the famine. A Catholic rural and urban bourgeoisie was on the rise, and things were changing but not really fast enough. It probably helps explain some of the attitudes of the Dublin police, that Dublin policemen were forbidden from being members of any secret society except the Freemasons. It was quite clear that anti-Catholic sectarianism remained deeply embedded in the structure of British rule and in Irish society itself. It was expressed quite openly during debates about self-government. When the Unionist MP T.W. Russell warned, if you set up a parliament in College Green, the historic site of the old Irish Parliament, the wealth, education, property and prosperity of Ulster will be handed over to a parliament which will be elected by peasants, dominated by priests, and they again will be dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. Now when Russell said that, he wasn't demanding a secular state, he was objecting to peasants, and Catholic peasants at that, being able to elect a parliament at all. The fact that by 1914, a private army ruled in Ulster with the acquiescence of the British state further enforced nationalist alienation. 